Welcome to this uh, pre-cal final review for the fall semester. And I want to go ahead and actually um, start right away. Now, I know that a lot of this, um, when you work on this, one of the best things for you to do is try it. Now, after you see me try it, you should go ahead and try it again without actually looking at the answer. Because the best way you could see if you actually remember the information is see if you could recreate the same answer again. Now, let's go ahead and start with question number one. Um, this is a quadratic square family, and the equation is f of x, x squared. The domain on this, since it exists everywhere in the x's, it's negative infinity, positive infinity. Now, the range, though, is y such that y is everything greater than or equal to zero. The next one is the constant function. It's denoted by f of x is equal to c. And the range, domain on this one, same thing, goes from, if you look at the x values, it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. And this one only has y is an element of 1. So that means that the range only has one value, which is 1, because that's the only place that it encompasses. So let's go ahead and go over to the next one, square root. The square root has a function notation f of x is equal to the square root x. Or you could write, write it as x raised to the power of half, which actually means the square root. Now, the domain of this is x such that x is everything greater than 0. The range is y such that y is everything greater than 0. Now, let's go ahead and look at this next one, which is the uh, absolute value family. That one is written f of x equal to the, with the bars the absolute value of x. And if you look at the domain, the domain of this is from negative infinity to positive infinity. And this one, the range, since it doesn't exist over here, there's no existence here. It just means that everything is greater than zero. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and move down. All right. Let's go look at this one so right here. This is called the linear one. And the linear one has f of x equal to x. The domain on this is everything from negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Which means this line is going to encompass all real numbers for x and y. Now, the next one is a cube. F, written f of x is equal to x cubed. And this one is, the domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range is the same thing, negative infinity to positive infinity. The next one we're going to look at is the rational, also known as the reciprocal. That one is written as f of x equal to 1x. And this one specifically is all values of x such that x does not equal 0, which means there's an asymptote at 0. And the range, there's another, there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So it's all values of y except at y cannot equal 0. And that's actually written, that's, uh, that's located here. And the vertical asymptote's right there on the axis. And lastly, we're going to deal with the cube root. The cube root is f of x is equal to the cube root x. And the range is negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range, I mean, domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range is the same. Now, one of the biggest things that I want y'all to do, I kind of move through this quickly. When you're watching this video, go ahead and take pauses, pause it, review it. And actually, what I really want you to do is try it yourself before you look at it. And then after trying and look at the video. And then afterwards, go back and retry it again to make sure you know how to do it. Now, I may be going a little quickly for some of you on this. So it's a good idea to pause it just because all the answers are been already written. So I'm more, in a sense, giving an explanation of what they are. So feel free to pause the video at any time, write it down, and again, like I said, try it again to make sure you understand it. Now, the next question would dealt with even and odd, and they wanted us to determine algebraically if the following function was even, odd, or neither. And you must show all your work, which means that the even test is important to know. Even means that when you do apply f of negative x, you get back to the same equation, f of x. You know if you have something that's odd, if you find out that you apply the negative of f of x, and you get back f of negative x. Now, since we have to go in this order, the first thing we need to do is actually try for even. Why? Because it gives us this part of the equation, which is the same thing as this part. So once we know this part, if even fails, we're able to test for odd. Now, what do we do after you get that? You're going to be in task to get a solution to go ahead and apply this f of negative x, which shows up there and there. Afterwards, you apply the actual exponent to it, like to the fourth, it makes it positive, that negative in front of the x. That square makes it positive, which means that when I deal with this, 
I actually get back, this comes back being this. So finale, it means that, therefore, f of negative x is equal to fx, which is even. Now, why are we testing for odd if we know it's even? Because we want you to understand, especially if it's been, if you haven't reviewed this material, how to check for odd and how does it work. Odd means you apply f of negative x, which means you get that negative. Put it in the outside of our original equation. Afterwards, you distribute it. So the distribution of this means you're going to do this, this, and this, and finally end up with this. And the interesting part is that when you look at this, this does not equal. If you look at this, part of this and this do not equal, which means that it's not odd as a finale. Now, what happens if you try for even odd and it's not this and it's not even and it's not odd? Then we're left with our last one, which is neither. And that may, happen every, every, that may happen when we're dealing with these functions. So you've got to be able to know how to test for even uh, and neither. Okay, now let's look at this next one. So he's determined the following graph is a function. If it is, find a domain and range, intercept symmetry, x-axis, y-axis, or origin. So first of all, is it a function? Yes. Why? Because it per passes the vertical line test. And... What is the vertical line test? That means that for every x, we have this concept known as 101. For every 1x, there's one y, exactly. So when we do this, if you check it vertically, you'll find out that there is really no repetition of this graph of any values. And, and I just drew the lines to show vertically when you look to there, if there's, if there, as long as there's no two dots, you know how there's a dot here, um, then that means it passes the vertical line test. If there's two dots, it would fail it, but we don't have that scenario. So let me undo that dot. Now, is it a function? Yes. Let's go ahead and now talk about the domain. Domain of this, now this is finite. That means it goes specifically from certain points. It means that it goes from here, which is negative 3.5, and it ends right here, positive 3.5. And if you notice, we have fill in circles, which means included. So these included things are actually placed as brackets at the ends of this. <laughs> actually, you know, this is not 3.5, it's actually 2.5. So let's go ahead and correct that. So when we see this, those brackets, the ones I did in blue, are then later here. And after that, we just write the interval. It goes from negative 3.5 to 2.5. There's other ways to write this as well if you wanted to. Uh, you could also write it as this, negative 3.5, it's greater or equal to x, greater or equal to 2.5. This bracket notation is just another way to write it. Now, when we look at the range, the range is going to be the values that go from here to here. So that means now we're looking from here, which is negative 3.5, and we're going to here, which is this is 3.5 in this case. Again, this is included since it's a fill in dot, which means I have a bracket like this. And because of that, I have the range that goes from what we just stated from the low point A to 3.5 to 3.5. Again, you could write it in this notation, but with the Y in the middle. Uh, another thing that's important to note, what do we do if it's an open circle? I know <coughs> we haven't really talked about that. Supposing this, this one right here was actually open. That means that in that certain spot, this would actually had been would be an actual parenthesis. Uh, uh, an open parenthesis, not a bracket. You would have a parenthesis in that case. But that's not the case, but I wanted to go ahead and point that out to you. Now let's go ahead and talk about the intercepts. Intercepts, you're just going to write them out. Here was identified, so negative 3, 0, negative 0 0.5, the y-intercept, x-intercept. Any extra y-intercepts are going to go here. Specifically, there's four of them. So that's how we get it. Now, is there any symmetry? There's none with this one. Because why? Because if there's no symmetry on the x or y-axis. There's really no symmetry, uh, or even in the origin. And in order to be symmetrical, you either have to be able to fill it, you, know, you have to fold it, and it has to be exactly the same, symmetrical, the idea of symmetry. Now let's go ahead and do number four. Determine if the graphs are even or odd. Now, 
This is very important to note in each one of these. You're going to have to use your creative imagination or fold the paper. We did this with patty paper. If it was even, it's symmetric to the y-axis. That means if I folded this, I folded this paper right here, right there, exactly right there. I did a fold. If I did a fold there and it was exactly the same, I'll have it even. Now this one is odd, which goes to show you that this not, it's not, it's, and when you look at it algebraically, it's not even because when I do the fold, I will end up with the line. The first fold will be with the line here. And that's what's going to happen with the first fold. Now, this else, this is also important. That if it's odd, it's symmetrical to the origin, which means that when you do the first fold, like what I did here, I'm going to go ahead and apply a second fold. And the second fold is going to match specifically with this. When I do a second fold, so you fold once and you fold again, it's actually going to match with this, which means that it passes for odd. And that's because you do two folds to it. So if you find that, then it is asymmetrical to the origin, which means that we have an even, I mean, a odd function, like with this one. First fold on this would make this thing look like this. Second fold will actually bring it up like this to make it equal which would be odd. Now remember, when you do the folds, it's kind of thing like that cancels out. It's no longer there. So that's how you're able to tell. Uh, this one, we'd go ahead and do a fold. And actually, when you do the fold on this, I think you end up with this kind of graph like this. So this kind of cancels out because you did the first fold. And when you do the second fold, you actually do end up with this function because it all folds in. So you cancel this out. The red after that it folds it folds into it so that's how you get odd now this is the only one that's even why because once we do the fold we actually end up with this and that's a test for even okay great let's go ahead and move on to the next this one says use the function below to find the intercepts domain and range intervals where the graph is increasing decreasing constant also determine the functions even or odd or neither so let's go ahead and first start with the intercepts. The intercepts just means where it crosses. And we actually have a few. We have this one, that one, that one, this one. Those are it. So I have actually I have looked for any for all x intercepts, for any x intercepts. Actually, um, we're not going to have the y's. We're just going to have the x's in this case. So uh, in this one, for the intercepts, Let's go ahead and write down, you're going to, well, actually, if you, yes, we are going to be writing down, um, hold on, I, I put them in the wrong space. I, I had a first find my x and y axis, which was here, which means I have specifically intercepts, okay, this is, uh, I, I thought the axis, would, here's the x axis, and because of that, that means we actually have intercepts here, here, and here. I'm sorry, not here, here. I'm looking at the wrong spot there, and I think that one's not actually there, there, not that one. Okay, let's fix our ideas here for a second. Not there. That was actually created from, from where we're trying to show something else, so that's not part of it. The intercepts specifically happen. Let me put them in a different color. Here, here. And here, there's where the intercepts at. So, like in this case, we're going to have our y intercept there, which is this one, our two x intercepts here, which is these two down here. Okay, great. Now, with that, let's go ahead and talk about the domain. The domain goes specifically from specific values here, which is negative six, and from here, which is positive six. And again, since we have close and dots, we have brackets. Now the range goes specifically, here's my lowest point for my range. So that's negative 1. To my highest point, which is right here, which is 6. And again, they're both filled in. This one and this one are filled in. So my range actually goes from negative 1 to 6. Again, I want to point it out. If I had an open circle, like let's say this one was open, that means I would have an open parentheses there. But this is not the case. The case is that I don't have that. So let's go ahead and take that away. Take that away. Now let's talk about where it's increasing. Increasing means that for as the x goes, the y's are going up. 
and there's only one place for that. It's increasing right here and actually increasing right here. So if you notice, there's actually two intervals that we're putting that it's increasing. It's going from negative 3 to negative 2, these two right here, and it's going from 5 to 6, which is here and here. Now, the decreasing is the other way around. This is for x and y. This is for increasing. Let me change the colors. Decreasing means as the x go forward, the y's are going down, which means that we have that specifically just in location there. And it goes from 1 to 5. Now, let me go ahead and erase some of this because I don't want to make sure I don't want to confuse you with some of the other things. And now let's talk about specifically where's the constant. Constant means that it's not moving. It's just for every, for every x, there's no change in x or y. As x is moving, there's no change in y. That's for constant. And that happens here from negative 6 to negative 3. So you notice there and there. And so actually, you know what? I probably get an idea by how to, well, not highlight I'll just put it in a line. There's a constant there, and there'll be another one here, which goes from negative 2 to positive 1. So it shows up here. Now, is an even on there? Neither. Neither in this case, because when you do a fold and you do the second fold, it doesn't match up. It's not symmetrical to any, any of those two, so it's neither. Okay, let's go ahead and do the next one, number 6. This is determine the intercepts, domain, and range, and the values of the local maximum minimum for this graph. Okay. Now, the intercepts, again, it's going to be all the places where it crosses the x or y axis. So here, here, and here, here. Oh, I'm sorry, not there. Actually, you know what? We always have to have, I don't know, hold on, hold on. You always have to make sure you have well defined your, your x and y axis. So let me go ahead and do that first so I'll make sure there's no confusion. This is the x axis right here. That's the reason why we have those intercepts. And there should be five on here, and there's five listed on here. So you write those down. As far as the domain, the domain means not the same thing. This is finite, which means that when we, if you ever box, some people are used to boxing these things. If you ever box this, yeah, that means that none of this exists. So specifically, my domain goes from negative 3.5, including, that's the reason why you have the bracket to positive 3.5, the bracket, which is located right here, 3.5, which is that on the x-axis. Now, as far as range, my minimum point is negative 3 included to positive 4 included. Again, if you had an open circle, supposing that this one was open and I wanted to do the range, this would be an open parenthesis. Now, is it symmetrical? Yes, it's symmetrical to the y-axis in this case. Now, let me erase some of this. So we could focus on that. Why is it symmetrical to the y-axis? Because if I made a line right here, you'll find out that you have a y-axis symmetry. Now, local maximum and minimums. Those are specifically, there's actually, it's not the, there's global. These are called global uh, maximums. Let me show you which ones I'm talking about. Um... Uh, you have, these are called global, a global maximum. So we don't want a global, we want local. Local are the ones that are not global, which means that like this one, that's one, and this is, actually no, those are the minimums. Let's uh, undo that real quick. Which means that this is a, a local, because it's not global, it's not one of the, the highest ones, that's a local one too. So if you notice, they're written right here, negative 2, 2.9, and 2, 2, positive 2, 2.9. Now, the local minimums follow the same idea. Uh, let's see, local minimum are going to be this one and this one. Now, the reason why this one qualifies is that the global one's exactly where it ends, right there and there. So for this one, it's going to be actually all three. Now, let's... um. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Oh, actually, you know what? I want to make sure I covered everything to do with this one. Yes, I did. Okay, great. So now let's go ahead and talk about this one. Now, this one, it says test the following equation for each type of symmetry. Um, and that means if you're trying to figure out, uh, is it uh, 
even, odd, or neither. So with that, let's go ahead. The first application we're going to do with this one is in regards to this f of the negative x. So specifically, I'm going to apply that into my equation, which means I get in there. Now with this one, once you cube this negative, you actually do make the equation negative. And this negative and this negative make this equation positive, which means it's not symmetrical to the y-axis because it's not even, if you notice. Because this does not match this. Remember, they have to be equal. That's the test right here. f of negative x is equal to f of x. Now let's see if it's symmetrical to the origin. So now in this one, we're going to go ahead and apply the same, well, not the same test, but the test is going to be done as is f of negative x equal to negative f of x, which means specifically I'll be focusing on this side right here. Specifically, that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So I am going to be applying f of negative x, the negative here to the negative here, and then distributing here and here, and I'll get the negative f of x, x cubed plus 5x, which means this one is a real nice one to show because if you notice, it means this is actually equal to this. And if you have that, that means you have the test for odd, which means that it is going to be symmetrical to the origin, which means it's odd. So this one's odd in this case. Now let's go ahead and apply these next ones. Now these are going to be a, comp not a composition, but they're going to be specifically um, functions that they want us to do uh, operations to them. So like with this one, the first one, they want us to apply, when you see f of g just like that, that means they want me to apply this. So when you think about it, this really equals this. f of x is equal to g of x, which means and then afterwards you do some substitutions. But I, what do you substitute? Specifically, you substitute the x squared x plus 2, and you multiply with the 3x minus 5. What happens when you do that? This occurs. This is your answer right here. The reason being is you really can't, you could simplify it some. Actually, the only thing you could really do is uh, distribute, actually, this. It's the only thing you really could do is distribute the square root of x plus 2 because you can't break that up. So you distribute it, and you actually end up with this over here of 3 of x, x squared plus 2, minus 5 of x squared plus 2. Now let's talk about the next one, question 9. Now this one they want us to do specifically the operation of f minus g of x, which is f of x minus g of x, which means, again, we do a substitution. First substitution here, which was came from here. Second substitution here, which came from g of x. And what do we do? We combine like terms. Except, right before combining like terms, you need to make sure that this negative gets distributed. Now, I'll say that the number one thing I'll see people doing wrong in this answer is they will put the minus, but they won't put it in parentheses, and they will forget about the distribution. The distri without the distribution, you're going to get a wrong answer. So make sure you put it in parentheses, distribute, and then combine like terms. Most people are actually really good about combining like terms. 2x squared. Those are the same, and then lastly, these are make negative 8, so then you have your answer there. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Uh, now, with this one, number 10, they want us to add them together, so we're going to go ahead and apply the addition. f of x is equal to g of x, and then we're going to have these two fractions right here. Now, what do we do? The first thing we got to do is get a common denominator. So Specifically, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to take this denominator that's right there, it just came up in red, and apply it on both of those because I want to make sure I get a common denominator. And then secondly, I want to get this x plus 1, which made it black, but I want to go ahead and do that specifically. I'm going to go ahead and erase this because I want to make sure you all can see this. Now, after that, you distribute and you make one denominator. So like in my case, I distribute, make one denominator, I end up with this, and then I just simplify to end up with this as an answer. 
Now let's go ahead and move on to number 11. Number 11 has us dividing. And in this operation, f divided by g of x really means this. So after we do the substitution, first substitution, which comes from here, second substitution goes down there, we factor, we simplify. Anytime you have this, that's the reason why we combine like terms. In this case, it's necessary for us to factor the denominator. So we end up with this, and we find out that these specifically cancel. This cancels out with this, so you're left with this as an answer. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and go to number 12. Now this one says determine the domain for each function. Use a calculator and the denominator. What do they want us to do? First of all, when we're going to find to determine the domain, um, you can go ahead and actually use your calculator if you want to check your answer, but for the most part, you should be able to do some of this just by uh, looking at the equation and factoring. Like in this case, we're looking specifically just for the denominator. Remember, domain is specific in the idea that you cannot have this. This is illegal in math. Actually, let me change this. This is illegal in math. Having some kind of number divided by zero. What do I mean? Examples, two divided by zero. Illegal. Uh, any number, three divided by zero. Anything divided by zero is illegal. What is legal? A everything else. If zero divided by three. Everything else that is, doesn't fall into this kind of category. This is okay. Why? This is zero. Zero exists. Zero is an element of all real numbers. Zero is part of our natural number, well, not an integer counting system, negative one, zero, one, two. It's part of it. So because of that, you could have this. You could have a zero. It's okay. You can't have the other way around. You can't divide by zero. So like in this case, there's specific values and where these cannot divide by zero. Like in this case, once I factor the bottom, I'll find out that Kennedy can have it equal to negative five or positive five. This one is all real numbers because there's nowhere where that's going to be divided by zero. On question C, same thing. It's going to be everywhere. And same thing with question D. It's going to be everywhere because with B, C, and D. With B, C, and D, you will get this where it's okay. It's where you have question A where you're going to get this right here. And where, and it actually happens specifically in these two values there. Now let's go ahead and move on to the next one, question 13. It says, graph the piecewise function on the grid provided below. Identify the domain range and the intercepts of the piecewise. Now one of the things you got to keep in mind when we did piecewise functions is that you had a... Oh, oh are you looking for me? Okay, let's go ahead and continue with this piecewise function. Now, with the piecewise function, you specifically have different functions that are, are going to be only graphed in certain places, which means, like in this case, uh, this right here, it's only going to be graph negative 2 to positive 1, which means that function is going to be only going to exist right there. Now, x squared plus 1, this is a parabola, which means that this one actually is just represented from there to there. And specifically, we're going to have an open circle with that parabola. Now, what else do we have here? We have another type of function, another piecewise function, that is from here to here, which actually is, uh, let me change the color of that, because I don't want it to, let's make that yellow. This one right here specifically goes from 1, so it actually encompasses part of that. It goes, well, hold on, I'm doing the x-axis. It goes from here to there. That's it. So that means that line function is specifically going to be from 2x. Now, this is interesting. There's a dot there and a line, a linear line that gets formed, and it doesn't include our last value, which is 3. Not included. So that's the reason why you see an open circle. This is a line. This is actually a parabola because of the piecewise. So, lastly, we're going to do this piece green from here, specifically on the way out, 
all the way to infinity, we're going to have this line, which is negative 3x plus 8. Uh, we're going to have this line drawn on here. It goes from here, and we do the slope, but we'll have a line like this. Now let's talk about the domain. And the domain on this specifically only exists from here on that way, and it's included. So which means that it's everything greater than negative 2. So we have, there's two ways we wrote it. Like this, second way, like that. Negative 2 to positive infinity. It's everything greater. This is everything that way. Now the range is kind of interesting because we have certain spots. Let me erase some of this. Uh, that it doesn't exist. There's actually specifically our range on this one does not exist in this location. Right here. And it doesn't specifically exist right there, including that line. Which means that I have, in essence, from positive 1 to 6 not included. And that's how this shows up. That, that specific range of values, actually from here to here, shows up specifically in the in our answer choice as this. That's how it shows up specifically. Now, another thing, this goes from over here to negative infinity, that shows up here. So we get that. There's only one intercept that occurs, which is right here, 0, 1, which is right there. And that's how you get the domain and range. It's important that you keep in mind that we use a union function because there's nothing that exists between there, but we're saying there's two parts that we need to talk about the range in this case. So that's question 13. Now let's move to question 14. This is right here. Is the graph below continuous over the domain of all real numbers? If not, give an example of a, continue, of a graph that is continuous over the domain of all real numbers. Now, is this one continuous? No, it's not continuous over the domain of all real numbers. The domain for this graph is from negative 1 to 2, which means a graph with the domain of negative infinity to positive infinity, f, x or f of x equal to x, or f of x equal to positive x, these are several or more examples that give you that. Let's, um, okay, great. So let's go ahead and continue with the next one. Now what this one says, use the graph to show and determine the following. The equation of the graph, the holes in the graph, the domain of each function, vertical asymptotes, oh, actually the range of the function, vertical asymptotes of any, horizontal asymptotes of any, oblique asymptotes of any, and the intercepts. So let's start with A. What is the equation of this graph? Well, this equation actually can be derived by just finding the intercepts. If you know you have um, here and here and here, you realize that you have a function that could be represented by x minus 2 and x plus 5 from specifically this location. Uh, let me use a highlighter to talk about that. It could be specified there. This could be come from there. And lastly, the negative x because it's flipped around. It's graphed that um, when you look into most of the n behaviors, you'll find out that there is a negative that's being applied to it. So that's actually how you come up with now. Is there any holes present? No. There's no holes that are present. Uh, what is the r domain of this? Since we have these lines that go from there to there, it means that we have two things. All real numbers for the domain, all real numbers for the range, since it encompasses everything. There is no vertical asymptotes. There's no horizontal asymptotes, and there's no oblique asymptotes. Oblique are the ones that are diagonal. And what do we have our intercepts exactly where, except for the last one? Those three are actually, the three that cross the x-axis, those are your actual intercepts. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and move on. Question 16. It says, use the graph to show to determine the following. Equation of the graph, domain of each function, and well, the holes in the graph, the main image function, pretty much everything we were doing before now, what is the equation of this graph? Uh, we would determine it being x minus 1 squared, x plus 1, x minus 3. Now, is there any holes? No, there actually is no holes in the graph. Now, when you, how do you recognize a hole? 
you you see like an actual hole. What I mean, I mean somewhere in here, you actually would have some kind of open circle, and we don't have that. So like in this case, now what is the domain of the function? It exists everywhere. You see these lines exi exist everywhere, except in two locations: this vertical asymptote here, and this other asymptote here, which shows up like this. Which means that x is everywhere except in those two locations. And what about the if there's any horizontal asymptotes for the range? Yes, there's one right there. And that shows up here. The line does not equal one. Now, let's talk about vertical asymptotes. Yes, we identified the one x equal to negative one. Horizontal, actually vertical, there's two. X equal to negative one and x equal to three. And horizontal, the y equal to one, which is right there. Now, oblique, none. If you have a horizontal, you, you, you're either going to have horizontal or oblique. And then as far as the intercepts, we have intercepts at, uh, so I was asking the last one, intercepts of any? Uh, yes, there is. Um, there's two there. Sometimes you could identify this, but there will be two of them, one in 0, negative 1, and one in 1, 0. Let me calculate it. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Describe the end behavior from this function. Now, if I graph this function, now if I use the power function of this, if I wanted to get a quick idea of what this is going to look like, um, the x minus 4 would be a quick way to think about that. Or you could plug it the whole thing in your calculator. But in essence, you're going to get a graph that at some point, it's going to look, just, it's going to look like that. It's going to be uh, some kind of parabola because of the even but of the even um, exponent that you see up there, the one I highlighted. But that's kind of like the power function of this. And if we see this as x approaches infinity, which means that as I go this way, this thing is going to go to infinity. And as x approaches negative infinity, this thing will also go to positive infinity. And the below means the same thing. As x goes to infinity, you will get the same. OK, let's go ahead and move on with this. Let's uh, now go to write the functions whose graph this is f, y equals square root x, but it's shifted to two units to the right and five units down and is reflected about the y-axis. So let's go ahead and talk this about this in steps. We have reflected. It's the reason why you're going to have that negative there. Shifted two units to the right. That is a, an h value, which is here. And then lastly, five units down, that's a k value that shows up there. So that's how you identify these. Because remember, you're always talking about uh, the A. Remember, the general equation of some of this, or this one specifically, would be those those components. And if, if in anything, you need to go back and look at the general equation to remember this. It's uh, It was written like this, negative A, x minus h, plus k. And there's more in here. There's actually more notation, just depending on what we're talking about. But this is what you will have. Now it says, write the equation. That represents a graph y equals f of x after it's been reflected over the x-axis and translated horizontally 17 units to the left and vertically translated 4 units up. Again, let's go ahead and just apply. Reflection is going to show up as a negative there. Uh, translates horizontally 7 units to the left is a positive 7 specifically. And then moved 4 units up is a positive 4. And that's how you get that. Now let's talk about question 20. Identify the parent function of the following equation. Then describe each of the transformations you would make to the parent function of the group equation. Well, parent function would be this. f of x is equal to x, which is the absolute value. A couple of things are going to occur. You can have a vertically stretch of 2. You'll have it move left to the 3 units and down 1 unit. The reason being, left 3 units comes from there. Down one unit comes from here because of the minus. And vertically stretched by 2 came specifically from that 2, that a value that's here. Okay, let's move on to the next one. It says the graph of the function f by starting with the graph y equals x squared using the transformation shifting, compressing, and reflection. You will need to rewrite it f of x in the form f of x is equal to a x minus h squared and explain your transformation. Okay. okay, what do we need to do with this one? This one, basically, they want it in vertex form. 
And if they want in vertex form, which is specifically this form right here, we need to take this equation that we have and complete the square with it. Now, how do we do complete the square? Well, first of all, you need to factor out the a. So you see how we set up the equation, which is right here. And then we went ahead and factored out this a. What do we do afterwards? Okay, afterwards, you're going to take the new b value, and you're going to divide it by 2, and then square it. What does that produce? It produces a 1 that's going to be placed right here. And at the same time, in order to complete the square, in order to keep everything balanced, so we, we can't magically just make a 1 appear. We need to make do 3 times negative 1, which shows up here. That's how they, those two greens keep the equation balanced, which means that if I ever decided to go ahead and factor it back out, those two will cancel. Now, what do we do? We go ahead and rewrite it out, and finally we simplify. And the simplification shows us that we have a vertex, negative 1, negative 4, and that our A is positive, which means it's going to be going up. And then after that, we're able to graph. So here's our graph one that we just came up with. And this one is the parent function right here. Okay, fantastic. Go ahead and... All right, so let's go ahead and continue with this. Um, the explanations of transformations is that it's a vertical stretch of three. And also we have left one unit, down four units. Now let's go ahead and go move on to the next problem. So it's for problems 22 and 23, graph each of the following functions using techniques of shifting, compressing, reflecting. Start by using the parent function and explain the transformations made to create the new graph. So with the first one, the parent function actually ends up being the square, the quadratic function, which is f of x is equal to x squared. What transformations are occurring? Well, first of all, we're going to have a shift over to the left of 2 because of that. We're also going to have a stretching of a half because a horizontal stretching because of the half you see on the outside. So what does it do? Specifically, it moves everything. So my original one, it takes my original one, which would have been here. It would have been something look like this, 2, 4. And what did it do? Well, they moved everything over to the left by two units. So each of these points are moved over to the left by two units. And not only that, but it also stretched them by two units as well, horizontally. So that's the reason why you see negative 4 and positive 2 in this case. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. And it's going to ask us to do the same thing. So use this one. So with this one, this one is a cube function. So the cube parent function is this, x cubed. Now, what is going on? Well, first of all, we're going to have negative 4, which means it's going to be to the right of 4 units. And then after that, we'll have this little negative that's outside, which means it's going to reflect it. And then lastly, the k value in this case is going to be the 1, which means we'll have one up one unit. So when you do the parent function on this one, function being like this. We're going to have these transformations. Everything got moved up a unit over to the floor. So that's the reason why that got moved there. And then also the reflection which moved everything. Now let's go ahead and do the next one. It says use the graph below to find the domain. And so when looking at this graph, the domain is going to be specifically all units, all real numbers, but just not here, just right not in 2. So that's the reason why you have all real numbers x such that it is not equal to. Now the range is going to be all the numbers except that y equals 0. So and y is all the real numbers, just not 0. Now they want us to list any intercepts of any, and there is one intercept, and it's a y-intercept that's located right here. And that's the reason why we have this. And horizontal asymptotes, y equals 0, which was the green line you see up there. And as far as the vertical asymptotes, x equals 2, which was the yellow line you see up there. Oblique, none on this one. So let's move on to the next one. Now this one says graph the quadratic equation by determining the graph opens up or down. 
Planning is at vertex, axis symmetry, y intercept, x intercept, so determine the domain and range, whether the function is increasing or whether it's decreasing. Well, first of all, we have to remember a couple of equations. The first equation that we need to memorize is this one, the vertex equation. And this vertex equation will deliver our vertex. Now, it's important that we keep in mind that we have, this is our A, that's our B, that's our C. Which means that we're going to use those values in the computation of the vertex. Like, for instance, we're going to see that you're going to substitute. You're going to start with this part here. You substitute B, which is negative 2, and you substitute A. And we get this. Simplify. Afterwards, we find out that the X is 3. With that in mind now, you could actually apply the next one, F of 3, with the second part of the vertex formula. You apply that into the equation, and you end up finding now you get 7 which means that as a finale, this is it. That's your vertex. Axis symmetry is located the x value of the vertex, so you get that right away. Now the y-intercept is found by taking 0, c. So if you do 0, you'll find out that uh, you'll end up with 4 as an answer. So if I put x is all at 0, and 4 is an answer. Now the x-intercepts. you got to make sure you understand the quadratic formula and its uses. One of the uses it has is that you can find the x-intercepts. What do we do? We substitute all the values. And finally, we get up, we get this value at the end. That is 6 plus or minus 3 square root of 28 divided by 3. That gives us our x-intercepts. And with that, we're able to fill all this in over here. Hope it's down vertex, axis symmetry, y-intercept, x-intercept, domain, and increasing and in range. Well, it's important to note, once you have this information, you're able to graph it, and then from the graph, tell all this information as far as like increasing, decreasing, those kind of values. So if you notice, it's increasing from negative, negative infinity to 3. So specifically, I'm looking at this part right here. And it's decreasing from 3 to infinity. Domain and range are slightly different now. To find the range on this, you will have to find the maximum. So look for the maximum, and from there, you can go ahead and, and find out what the range is. So just go ahead and put this into your calculator and then go over to second calc and look for the maximum that it's going to be in between those two values. Like make the little brackets. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This is right here. Use appropriate invest interest form to determine the amount that will be needed for an account. So if you have 5,000 invested at 3.9 compounded weekly after a period of three and a half years, how much money do you have? Well, with that, you have to make sure you understand this formula right here. A is equal to P, 1 plus R and T. After that, you substitute. Now, one thing I want to make sure you all understand, that you see up here is in the decimal form. You write that in. And then all the other values you substitute to get the answer. Question 27. Question 27, anytime you hear the word compounded continuously, you need to use this equation, which is PERT. And all you need to do is find the P, which is outlined right here, 2,500, the R, which is 11.9, and the T. Now, please keep in mind, we are making it into a decimal. And then after that, you generate your solution, which is there. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Now, with this one right here, they want us to graph this, and they want to write it, first of all, in the slowest term. So part A, you're going to have to do some factoring. So with this one, we factor first the numerator, and then after the words, we're able to factor the denominator. Now, after we have that, then we'll have our equation in slowest term. Now, when we find the domain, when you graph it, there's two places it doesn't exist, and it comes because of these two values right here. It's not going to exist at negative 2 and positive 2. So at those values, so it's going to, x is going to be all real numbers except for those two values. Part C, find the x and y intercepts. Now to find the x intercepts, you need to take the numerator, which is the p of x, this value right here, p of x, which pertains particularly just to this value right here. You need to set each of those equal to 0. x plus 3, x minus 1. Afterwards, you solve. So you'll get these answers right here. And you'll find out that you get negative 3 and 1, 0 as your x-intercepts. So now as far as to get the y-intercepts, 
you need to set the x equal to zero. Once you have that, this is zero, that's zero, this is zero. And pretty much all that cancels out. So those cancel, that cancels. You're left with negative 3 divided by 8. And you're given this as the solution, 3 over 8. Now let's go over to the next one. Find the vertical asymptotes. In essence, we pretty much found them because it's wherever the domain doesn't equal. But you're going to take the Q of X specifically and set those equal to zero. And last one, not lastly, it says find the horizontal oblique asymptotes. Now this is where it's important to know. Either you're going to have a couple of things that are occurring here, some things that you have notes on. You're going to find out that the, the numerator is, well, actually, you know what, let me get to the, this is not, let me get a better writing utensil to show you. You have scenarios, numerator is smaller than denominator, numerator is equal to the denominator, uh, or the other way around, numerator is bigger than the denominator. In this case, we have the middle, which means you take the leading terms and you, f you set it equal to y, whatever cancels. Now this cancels, which means you're left with a half. And since you're left with a the half, then you have a horizontal asymptote, specifically at those values. Now, F. F says determine if and where your graph crosses a horizontal or oblique asymptotes. So for that, we set half equal to the equation. And once we set the half equal to the equation, we go ahead and start solving. So we go ahead and do this and do this. So we multiply. We multiply the denominator this way. The actually the denominator this one, this one, and the denominator that way. So we get everything in equal terms. Afterwards, we simplify, and we find out that you end up getting a, a value like this: negative two is equal to four x. You solve for x, and you find out where it crosses exactly at x equals negative one half. And afterwards, you graph it. So in the graphing part, go ahead and graph it. Put in your values you came up with, and also put in your asymptotes as so and there we go and also any points that you may have let's go ahead and now look at the next one question 29 says for the given function f and g find the fog of x and the goth of x the g of x for each of the functions now with this one we got to make sure that first of all you start by writing the domains of each of the functions the reason being is that these domains are going to carry over to the end. So whatever it is that you have, this domain actually is already carried over when you look at the solution here. The domain for the other one is actually also carried over as well. Now, before we get into it, let's go ahead and actually talk about what it does it mean. To find the f, the fog of g of x, is really just substituting g of x wherever x is at. And specifically, I'm talking about this. G of x is going to go particularly right in here, which was f of g of x. Which means that before I had f of x is equal to square root of x plus 8. What happens? This changes specifically into this. What do you do afterwards? You simplify. The simplification of it produces this answer here. So this is the answer you'll put down here. Okay. Uh, now let's go ahead and talk about the next one. The next one is the other way around, the Goff of x. So that means you take the other one and you substitute that in here. That's the reason why you see the substitution is in here, which goes in from in there. What do you do afterwards? Well, you simplify. Particularly this and the square root cancel. So you're left with this. These combine to give you 3. And afterwards you have your answer, which is right here x plus 3. So that's how you do composition of the function. Now it says a function f is 1 and 1. Find its inverse, state the domain f, and find its range using the inverse of it. Now one of the things we got to do with these, okay, is you got to switch the positions. When you're trying to find the inverse, you got to switch the positions of the x and y. So one of the things you're going to see is that this is really means y. But what happens? We switch positions. So we end up, we switch positions, so we end up with this, x there and y there now. Once we have that, we solve for y. 
And the way we do it on this one is that we need to multiply the denominators together. I mean, multiply it up here. Multiply it there. Those are going to cancel. And then from here, we are left with this equation here. We distribute. So we now have xy plus 3x minus 2. What do we do afterwards? We start simplifying. Remember, we want to isolate that y. So I'm going to get rid of, or I want to get rid of, negative 3x, negative 3x. So we get xy is equal to negative 3x. Lastly, we divide by x, so we get this part down here. And then from there, we just go ahead and simplify, so we end up actually getting this here. And the f of inverse of x is this. We switch the y back to the inverse notation. Now, what's important to keep in mind here? A couple of things. The domain okay, of f and the inverse of f, the domain is the range of f the inverse. The range is the domain of f the inverse, which means that because I have this particularly, I can't have x equal to 0, which means that when I'm looking at the range of f of x of the original, y can't equal 0. Why? Because the domain of this one equals the range of the, of the, of the inverse is the range of the original one. Now, as far as the domain of the original one, that was actually given right up here. When you first started, this means it cannot equal negative 3. And the inverse is right here, restated. So that's what you want to go ahead and do in this one. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about this one. Suppose that you had the quantity supply S and the quantity demand of T of T-shirts at a constant given the following functions. S of P, 200 plus 50 P, and DP is equal to 1,000 minus 25 P, where P is the price in dollars. The equilibrium price of a market is defined as the price which quantity supplied equals quantity demand, S equal to D. Find the equilibrium price for t-shirts of this concern. What is the equilibrium? I mean, specifically, one does S of P equal D of P. So we substitute, and we end up getting these equations right here. Substitute the two equations. We simplify, and we find out what the price is. P is equal to $16. So exactly $16 is when is the equilibrium. And the way you tell is right here. If you substitute 16 into the equation and you solve, you get 600. Substitute 16 in here into this equation, it's 600 won. So the agreement on the price is at $16. And the equilibrium quantity is at 600. Now this one wants us to determine the prices which the quantity demand is greater than the quantity supplied. So they are asking us specifically, what is DP greater than S of P? So what do we do? Similar idea. We go ahead and we solve for P. And we end up finding out that it occurs anytime P is less than 6 by solving and manipulating this equation. So then we're able to say that anytime the P is less than 6, that's when we have that. Now let's go move on to question 32. The interest earned in the savings account investment, our use, can be modeled by this equation that's up here. Determine the amount of interest that can be at 2400 Now, this is where you have to pay particular attention to domains because, see, this means it's going to fit right in here into the equation there. And that's the reason why you see this equation being used, the 2400 and you get your I of X. Let's see, how much more interest would an account with 1000 earn than an account with 999 Well, that means that we're going to do one or two things. For the account for 1999 it's going to be this equation here. So that's the reason why you see this equation being used and us getting I of X is $5. Using the other equation, actually let me post that in green, which is the same one as a highlighted one in green. Using the highlighted one in green, we'll get 20 so that means that the thousand dollars would get earned fifteen dollars more in particular. You subtract two. You twenty minus five to know how much more. Okay, let's move on to the next one. All right, now this one says this is a revenue equation. You have this revenue equation, which is a quadratic, and it gives you a domain. 
and is an equation where P is a price and R is a revenue. What is the revenue of 20 units sold? With that, all we've got to do is take the equation and substitute. So the substitution, we put 20 here, 20 in here. We solve, we get the revenue for $20, $480. What quantity maximizes the revenue? We get the maximization at the revenue exactly at the vertex. So we're going to use our vertex equation to solve for that. Original vertex equation is this, negative b divided by 2a, which means that we're going to substitute this, 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 and this, and then afterwards substitute back in, I actually get the answer to figure out that x happens exactly at 250. So once we have where it happens, because really what's happening is if you notice this, this is a quadratic that is upside down. We're really searching for this. So we know right now the x value is 250. Oops, x value is 250. What I don't know is what is the y. And that is where I use the equation and I substitute it back in to find out what the y is. So if I use that, I substitute here, substitute there into the equation, and I deliver that I get the revenue of 3,125, which means that at 250 units, you get a maximum revenue of 3,125. Now it says right here, what is the price should the company charge to establish the maximum revenue? For that, we're going to take the maximum price, or the location, the axis of symmetry, and substitute it back into our P equation that came with this. How is it delivered? It's not, let's see, plus 25, yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is go ahead and take our price equation and substitute it in. Once we do that, we'll go ahead and get us at 1250 is the amount we should be charging for each one. All right, now question 34. Use the factor theorem. X minus C is determined if it's a factor form, X C minus quotient. So for that, we have to use synthetic division. Now, with synthetic division, you must remember that we must multiply. So like 3 times 2 equals 6, and then add them. So I get 5. 3 times that's 15. Add them, get negative 3. After that, I end up 0. So C of equal 3 is a factor. And I could go ahead and write it in this format right here. Okay, good. Let's move on to the next one. Form a polynomial whose zeros and degree are given. Negative 4 multiplicity of 2. 3 and multiplicity of 5. And degree and of a degree 8. What does it mean specifically? A couple of things. Multiplicity of 2 talks about the exponent power. So you see how this one says multiplicity of 5? It talks about there. The zeros is what forms this factor. So this factor that's in here comes because of that, which means that if I put negative 4 in there, I'll get a 0. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0. So, and so I have this one right here, which is x minus 3, and lastly, 8. So that's the reason right, x minus 8. Now, they want us to now, on question 36, list each real 0 and its multiplicity. Well, when I look at it, okay, this is going to generate my negative 1. And then 3 generates the multiplicity of 3. After that, x minus 3 makes a 3. And the 4 that you see here says it's a multiplicity of 4. And lastly, I'll have 4, which comes from there. But it's only a multiplicity of 1. Why? Because there's only a 1 there. That's the reason why. Determine if the graph crosses turns at each 0. Now this is where it's important to know that if it's even, turns. So a negative one, and we're talking about the multiplicity in particular. So multiplicity is, and if it's odd, it crosses. Remember, multiplicity. So like in this case, this first one is three, crosses. Next one is four, which means it turns. And this other one is odd crosses. Identify the power function. Remember, the power function is when you add up all the power. So specifically, I'm going to be adding up here, let me erase them because I think I specifically, I'm going to be adding 3, 4, and the one that's there. 
and they show up here, three, four, and one, which means I get eight powers, so that means the power function will be x equal to eight, like that. Okay, now do the next one. Form a polynomial f of x with the given zeros. You must multiply all the factors back together when giving your solution with real coefficients. So we have a degree four, and we have these um, polynomials here. So in order to have a degree four with these four polynomials or four zeros, that means that each one's going to be at zero. But specifically, each one generates this factor. It's almost the opposite of what it is because it's whatever makes that zero. And after that, we start combining, and we start factoring back in together, or we start distributing, foiling. Better, better put, we start foiling it all together, so we get this right here. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. This next one says right here, find all the roots, zeros of the polynomial function. Use the real root zeros to write each function in the factor form. Okay, with this one, we had to remember that this is P, P, and Q. And we list all the factors. So like for the factors for P, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. And we list them in plus or minus. For Q, it's plus or minus 1, plus or, mi plus or minus 2. After the words, we divide each one. And the division of it occurs in this particular manner. This divides into this, this divides into this. And then the other way around. This into this, and this into this. And once we're done with all that, okay, we could start, we, these are possible factors. So in order for us to find out what it is in factor form, we start using synthetic division. So the first one you want to start off with is one. Oops, hold on a second. Let me undo that. The first one you want to start off is with one. And you check it, see if it works. After that, you want to start off with, uh, like in this case, I think it was one and one again. So this one happened one, and then you check it again. You see how you get the factor form? You check it again. You start with one again, and, if it, and it worked twice, which means we had the square of two. And then this was left over. This was the following factor that was left over. So from here, once you got it down to three terms, you're able to go ahead, like this one we did A times C, method of factoring, but you end up getting, you're able to factor it, and we're going to get these terms like this, and set it equal to zero. Once you have that, then you have your equation, and then you're able to find the zeros. Now, you can use your calculator to help you find the zeros. That means you could go ahead and put it inside the calculator, this original equation, put it inside the calculator, you can see where it crosses, get an idea, okay, this is where it crosses. Okay, this all possible rational zeros for the following polynomial. Okay, what this one is real simple to do because all we have to do is take P, take Q, list all the factors, plus or minus all the factors here, and then after it's just divide them. So from here we get this division process. Now the division process is what confuses people. You divide this into there and this into there. So that's how you generate one and three. Afterwards you're going to take two, Divide that into there and take that divide into there. Remember, you don't do any repeat, so if you have a repeat, you acknowledge it. You throw it away. And then lastly, that into there and that into there. And you generate all these list of numbers you see there. So, now let's go ahead and move on to the next one. This one says, find the remaining zeros f of x of a complex polynomial whose coefficients are real numbers. So in this case, you got a degree 7. You got zeros 2, 5i, minus 3i. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind there's a conjugate theorem that says that the positive of it, so you see how this one's minus negative 5, the conjugate of it, and 3, also the positive, the plus 2i, these are also zeros. And you're going to use this. Okay, great. Hey, listen, let's go ahead and move on to the next question, question 41, which talks about uh, given the real cells, you multiply, must multiply all the factors back together to get the solution of real coefficients. Once you do this one, one of the things we're going to have to do is uh, we're given these zeros right here. 1, which forms this factor, negative 2, which forms this factor, 2i, which forms this factor, and in addition, we're also given this negative 2i. 
Now the reason why we're able to do that is because that is a conjugate and that factor specifically will make this last factor here. What do we do afterwards? We fall. We fall up until we get this answer right here. So if you want to go ahead and pause the video, take some time reviewing how to follow this, and then make sure you're able to generate the same answer we did here. Okay, let's move on to the next. Let's go to question 42. And 42 says find all zeros, including the complex zeros, and write f in completely factor form. Okay, with this, so x to the fourth, we're going to find out that there is two factors that negative 100 produces that can make add up to 21 because we're just going to factor this. Negative 100 and 25 and negative 4 would be the two factors. So with that, we're given this part right here and this part right here. Now specifically, this part right here will factor to x minus 2, x plus 2. But this part right here, once we solve it, we'll end up with this 5 because of the square root that occurs right here. Square root here and the square root here produces this answer that we have here. x is equal to plus or minus 5i. So in our case, we have the zeros negative 5i, 5i, 2, and negative 2. Okay, excellent. Let's move on to the next one. Okay. This next one, they want us to expand the logarithm and write the expression as the sum or difference of the logarithms. When we do when we do an expansion, a division, a division of logarithmic is expressed with a minus. A multiplication is expressed with a plus. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at this and start with taking it apart. Now we're going to start with the minus here because we're undoing this division. After that, the multiplication that shows up here is going to be it's going to be done or show up in here exactly in this highlighted part right here, the highlighted plus. Now, in there, there's another multiplication right in here. So that's going to show up as a plus here. But remember, there's a minus that still is here. So once we have that, then all we have to do is move the coefficients forward. So we get this. There's no coefficient there. And distribute the minus. Just move this coefficient forward. So we get that there. And then after that, we, get, we, we have this answer as our final answer. Now let's go ahead and move on to the next one, which is compress the logarithm. So we're going to go backwards and make it into a single one. Now what we must do, first of all, we got to move the coefficients back. And afterwards this plus, this plus you see here is exactly our multiplication we have in the logs. And then we're going to just going to apply this division, which is that there. So we get this as a final answer. Okay, now let's move on to question 45. Now 45, same process. Move the coefficient back, and then after it's just apply it. So like when we do this one, the division is going to form this right here. This minus forms that division, but we're able to factor this one. So the factoring, the numerator would produce that answer. Factor the denominator, you have x minus 1. Well, not really factoring the denominator, just expanding it. But the important part that we want to keep in mind that cancels with that. And we're just left with this as an answer. Excellent. Now let's, just, let's go ahead and solve each of these equations. Now once you're solving these algor those logarithms right here, you need to first, like the, this first one involved the compression. And the compression came in because we have this plus here, which makes that compression there. After that, we apply the log loop. Actually, let me undo that and write it with something else. Let's apply the log loop. So once we apply the log loop, okay, we're going to end up with this. Actually, the log loop should be applied here or there, wherever you want to think about it. But after that, we start our simplification process, and with that 2 cube becomes this 8 that's here. We subtract it to make it equal to 0, 
And then after that, so we're able to factor it and then set each of the factors equal to zero and come up with x equal to two. The reason why this is not it, you cannot have a negative log. If you graph the logs, remember all the log rhythmic values are in the positive values. Now what happens here? Now there's an identity function, basically means that says that when you have something the same base, it this equals this. Specifically that equals that. Now what do we do? We go ahead and set everything equal to zero, so we have 2x equal to negative 3, and then we just solve for x, so we get this solution that's right here. Now, if you ever in doubt how to do this, like if you want a little bit more of a labyrinth explanation, you could have taken the log of each one of these sides, and you would have found, well, not the log, the natural log. But actually, just, just know that, actually, just go ahead and apply the identity. If you ever see this, this is an identity function, which means you could just set them equals to them. Okay, let's look at the next one. Now, with this one here, uh, we're going to do a compression. And the compression shows up, because remember, you see how we have this little minus right here? Oh, hold on. I don't want to highlight it, not strike it out. But let me go ahead and highlight that. shows up as this here. So once we do the compression and we have the two logs, which are the same, they basically cancel out. And we're left with this part of it here. After that, all we got to do is multiply this by 3. Hold on, let me do that. I actually use an actual pen to do that. Multiply by 3, multiply by 3, so we end up with this answer. And then after that, we start solving, so we subtract 4, subtract 4, 2, divide by 3, divide by 3. Answer comes out being 2 thirds. Okay, question 49. Log loop at first. So once we do the log loop, we end up 5 squared, you go to that, so then that becomes 25 minus 3, so then we add 3. Add 3, get 28, divide by 7, divide by 7, end up with an answer of 4. Okay, now let's move on to question 50. It says rewrite the following expression using the change of base formula. The change of base formula in simple terms is just writing the log of 300 divided by the log of 17 in your calculator. It's just doing log. Uh, that's how it's written. Log, if it's log of BA. And the change of base is just log of A divided by log of B. That's all it is. That's all that's been applied there. Okay, great. Now we're going to be covering the uh, last unit that we covered, which is sequences. So a lot of the things are going to be, some, uh, be familiar. When you write out the first five terms, you're just going to write it the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And it's going to produce these answers right here. Which you're writing in your list here. That's the first five terms of this infinite sequence. Okay, how to find the rule and pattern? Three steps. You have to identify A1, which is here. So A1 is 3. If it's a constant D, which there is here, that means you have something that is arithmetic. And the reason why that's important. So if it's arithmetic, you're able to use this equation in here, and you're able to substitute the two values, 3 and 6 for D. We distribute and we simplify. And with that, we achieve here, simplify a little bit more, we get this, and then here's my rule. Okay, let's look at question 53. Now, 53, do the same three steps, but one of the things we're going to realize with this the second step has a constant ratio. And the constant ratio could always be found by taking a sub n plus 1 and divided by a sub n, which means you take like 12 and divide it by 4, you get 3. Which means that in this case, once you apply this here, you'll get this, this here. The important part that you need to keep in mind that if I haven't said it, is that the constant ratio means you have a geometric sequence. And a geometric sequence works with only this equation here, not the arithmetic. So with that, you're able to substitute in the correct formula and produce the correct answer. Now let's go ahead and write the expansion of the sum. Remember, the expanded form means we're going to go six terms. We're going to start at 1, 
all the way to six using that. So if you notice, one of the things you're going to realize is that we have them here. One, two, three, four, five, six. All six in the expanded form. And then you just simplify, and then you sum, and you get the answer. So there you go. Now, question 55. Express the sum using the summation notation. With this one right here in particular, because of its certain sequence, okay, we're going to find out that we have the sequence 2n plus 1, because of the way it gets formed. But its summation notation requires that we do a starting point, signify an ending point, and our equation, which means that our starting point is 1, we go to the 8th term, and here's our equation with our summation notation. Now let's go ahead and do the next one. It says find the indicated coefficients of the term. The fifth term of the expansion. Now this one is simple in the essence that you just have to realize how to use this equation. Okay, And let's go over the certain parts of this equation. I have to know n. n as descriptively shown here. Here's n. Okay, A is equal to 3x, B is equal to 2, and they come from here and here. The last part, J, that comes here, the J term. So J minus 1 is equal to 5 minus 1, which equals 4. And from here, you're able to use this equation that I highlighted into specific values. We get this, this, and this. And after you simplify, remember that if you need to do this computation, you either could do it by hand or you could do it using a calculator. Math, PRB, 3, and choose R to get this answer specifically. Once you get that, you find out that the fifth term is 240. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next one. Expand the binomial theorem. Now, with the binomial theorem, remember, you have to know the equation and the, and the expansion of it. You're going to use Pascal's triangle, and specifically Pascal's triangle on the eighth term. It's going to give you these coefficients, which is 1, 8, 28, 56, 70, 56, 28, 8, and 1. The most difficult part that I notice that people get stuck on after they start doing this once they get the coefficients, I think they understand the coefficients. The second the thing that I notice most people have a difficult time reasoning is how to get these coefficients in. If you notice, this 8 right here, once you distribute that, you get this right here, 5 to the 8, x to the 8. In this next one, you distribute this, you get 5 to the 7th. You see this 3 to the 1 power? I'm going to multiply it by 3 and then have this x to the 7th. So this in particular, those three numbers are going to multiply together to give me this. These two numbers got to multiply together to give me this. And we're going to do the same thing here. These numbers are going to get multiplied together. That again, the generation of it came from here. And the movement of this over there to the front of that. To make those three numbers that you see here. So that's how you get that, and that's how you do it, and you just do it throughout, and you're going to end up, do it correctly, with this answer down here. So if you want to go ahead and take some time to do it and see if you do end up with that answer. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Uh, we're going to expand and use Pascal's triangle. So the expansion of this means that at the sixth term of Pascal's triangle, we're going to be getting 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, and 1. Again, the same idea is going to be where you expand the coefficients. Like in the first expansion, you'll have, well, the first one, the terms will cancel because you see how this cancels. This part particularly, well, x to the 5, nothing's going to happen there. But this will produce negative. So this is going to show up right here. You're going to multiply that with 6. So they'll multiply together. 
and you do it for the next one. Now this one, when you distribute this, it doesn't do anything, but this it will. This is going to create this right here. You're going to multiply that with this. Remember this one now, we always have two coefficients. So you're going to have that throughout, these two coefficients, except for the part at the beginning where you have y equal to zero. If you don't know how to generate the Pascal triangles, we have a good demonstration, a good example right here. Start with one, and then you start adding until you get this part. So what I mean specifically by adding, these two create two, those two create three, three, four, six, four, so on and so on and so on. All right, let's go ahead and do the next one. Find a given term in the geometric sequence given a sub 1 and r equal to 2. Now, automatically, if you see an r, you know you have to use geometric, which means we use this one here. And from there, we submit 3 times 2. And particularly, we want to know the n, which is 12. Since n is 12, let me change. Actually, let me undo that part there. Since n is 12, here, we get 12 here. This is still 12. So a sub 12 comes out being 6,144. Okay, question 60 says find the term given the sequence. Well, three steps. Again, a sub 1 is 1. So I have the constant ratio. And you can do it because if you do 1 half divided by 1 equals 1 half. You could take any two terms, 1 fourth divided by 1 half equals a half. And the important part is you know how to use that equation. We substitute our two values, a and n, which means that we have a here and the m and r there. And then we calculate for a sub 10, and we get this here. And if you math bracket, you get a10 is equal to 1 divided by 512. Here's go question 61. 61 says find the, find the finite sum of the geometric sequence. So if we're going to find out the finite sum of a geometric sequence, you got to make sure you know understand how to use this equation right here. And we still develop our two steps here, a sub 1 and r. After that, it's a, a method of substitution. Here and here. And they wanted us to find for S10. So this, let's make a correction on here. There's a small mistake on this. The mistake then really should be is that they want us to find for S of 10, which means this is 10, the reason why this is 10. This should be 10, this should be 10, but this is your answer of S of 10 with those first 10 terms. All right, and let's go ahead and do the next one. It says find the finite sum of the geometric sequence. Now, the infinite. Now, if it's infinite, we have to check for convergence. And the convergence equation is simply like this. It is r less than 1. r is 1 third. And if it is a convergence, you see the check mark. We have it. If that's the case, we find a sub 1. We substitute it there, which shows up there. Substitute the r, that shows up there. We calculate, get that answer. And we write down our geometric. And the summation of all this is going to equate to 4.5. Now, in terms of where the infinite geometric series converges or diverges, if converges, find the sum. So this one's going to converge because r equal to 1 means the this convergence says substitute since you know a is we go to one we substitute there and there to get this and this calculate to get this answer here you want you could pause the video and take some time to understand it correctly okay so when you get here you find out r is equal to three r it's not less than one so this one diverges so we don't need to calculate that one and from here it looks like we're finished so Hooray! Good luck on the final review. Now, I know this video is quite long, but there are some parts you did not understand 
please go back, review it, try it on your own. Because if you could retry it without looking at your answer, like rewrite it on a new separate piece of paper, if you could go ahead and actually redo it by yourself, that means you've mastered it. It doesn't make any sense just to look at the video and not learn anything. Because you can look at this video, just look at it, write everything down. There's really no learning that occurred. Please redo. Please check for mastery of yourself. That means do you remember it? Do you understand it? And you apply it. Step one, step two, step three. They're like little letters. <laughs> that uh, that, that if, if you know you could do all these three steps, and you you got it. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to view this.